Now, look, there is there's a reason why Lovecraft, for example, has always been under so much, or I should say recently, been under attack in the last few years. And it's not about racism. Everyone tries to make it about racism. Now, just to, I want to show this is the weird fiction, defining the weird by this uh, lecturer, Michael Moore. I'm not sure if I get his name right, sounds French. And he talks about defining the weird. He does, I first found his channel because it had Lovecraft in one of his uh, lectures. And he starts off with the very de definition of, of weird. And this will give you insight. What a, uh, it's only going to be about three minutes long, so listen. The Gothic is a little bit more respectable than the weird is. There are people who have been doing um, various kinds of work, particularly connecting the Gothic uh, to women's studies, to gender studies, and to queer studies since the 1970s. Um, the weird has had fewer advocates, generally. But I think one of the things that kept the Gothic in disre uh, disrepute um, was a question of audience. Yeah, now, here, listen to that. This is important. It's a question of audience. It's a question of who uh, consumes weird fiction as opposed to who consumes Gothic literature. Now, when we are trying to put together literary canons for particular national traditions or particular genre traditions, usually the opinions that prevail are those of people who have a great deal of social and institutional prestige, right? So the sorts of people who determine what goes into a canon of literature are typically academic specialists in that field, right? Or eminent writers in that particular field. There are certain groups of people whose tastes and opinions tend to be almost universally disparaged. Uh, for example, one of the groups that is most often so disparaged, uh, preteen girls, right? Very few people have much respect for the taste of preteen girls. Now, before we go up, continue, so I just want to let you know, uh, preteen girls being disparaged, their taste, they're preteens, they're only kids, for one thing. But, uh, I mean, I suspect it has something to do with the fact that preteen boys tend to like uh, stories where there's goals and adults are more into that. <laughs> Whereas the preteen girls probably are not probably, they aren't. Now, given certain um, personal experiences, I will um, concede that many of the things preteen girls like are objectively terrible. Uh, my wife dragged me a couple of um, a year or two ago. Hold it. Preteens, and now he's talking about his wife. Is his wife, Mr. Marr, is your wife a preteen? To go see Newsies um, in Atlanta, and God, was that awful. But I digress. Uh, the tastes of the working class are often disparaged. The primary audience for the Gothic was middle-class women. And so it became this sort of middle-brow, sensationalistic genre um, that was associated with making middle-class women feel naughty feelings, right? Rather the same, you know, it was aimed at more or less the same kind of audience that contemporary romance novels are. There you go. Now you understand. The gothic horror is, as he admitted, uh, is aimed at women and to titillate them. And so this is why you don't see gothic horror slammed like uh, weird fiction, you know, like guys like Lovecraft. 
is the whole point is that it doesn't appeal to women, so therefore it can be bashed. If it appeals only to men, it can be bashed and will be bashed. It's not about racism. It's never been about racism. You could prove to me that Lovecraft was the most racist guy in the world. It wouldn't matter because it was never about that. It's no different than the infiltration to all the geek culture that's being destroyed, right? You do not see romance novels infiltrated and changed. Matter of fact, romance novels may be filled with feminists, but it's what women like, so it gets leaved, left alone. Understand? So the first two male, uh, the first two main categories are specifically gendered, not necessarily in terms of who writes them or even who consumes them, but who they're about. So the male Gothic primarily focuses on questions of identity and on the male protagonist's transgression of social taboos. It involves the confrontation of some isolated overreacher with the various social institutions, including the law, the church, and the family. So male Gothic is usually about some male protagonist overreaching the limits placed on him by society. Um, a good example of this kind of novel would be a book called The Monk. No, he talks about The Monk, but I would say a more apt uh, example would be Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, right? Because uh, Dr. Frankenstein is trying to break the rules. He's trying to defeat death, but he's also trying to make life without the usual sexual necessities. And of course, it also, it's very unique that way because Mary Shelley is also kind of, uh, you know, crapping on it because it bypasses men having to deal with women. So that's the, that's the feminine sacred, right? Uh, it's, you, we could get all into this, but th that's a great example of it. Uh, by this gentleman over here in the corner, uh, Matthew Lewis. Oh, becomes the primary threat to the female oh, protagonist. About an exceptionally pious young monk. Okay, sorry about that. Get back here. Try that again. So male gothic is usually about some male protagonist overreaching the limits placed on him by society. Um, a good example of this kind of novel would be a book called The Monk uh, by this gentleman over here in the corner, uh, Matthew Lewis. Oh, I didn't realize that that was how the screen worked. Okay, never mind. Um, so The Monk is about an exceptionally pious young monk um, who is led astray by temptations of the flesh um, in the form of an actual demon who has been hanging out in his monastery just waiting to lure him down the primrose path of sin. Now, female Gothic, on the other hand, um, <clears throat> reverses the gender polarity of the protagonist, right? So the transgressive male becomes the primary threat to the female protagonist, right? Female Gothic almost always, well, really always, focuses on a woman being threatened by a man. And Did you see that? Uh, the female Gothic always, according to him, is centered around a female being threatened by a man. He said, this shows, I'm sorry, this shows a true lack of imagination from the female gender. I, that's just why I tell you again, weird fiction is a male, it's basically male gothic. There's a fear of something else out there. Uh, men think of outside themselves and what are, what is women's fear? You know, it's it, it's got to do with the, <laughs> with men. But I don't think it's uh, so much of a fear because he'll explain. 
initially, she is usually depicted enjoying an idyllic and secluded life. This is followed by a period of imprisonment under the authority of a powerful male figure. Within this labyrinthine space, she is trapped and pursued, and the threat may variously be to her virtue or to her life. Now, the most famous author of female Gothic is this woman pictured over here, Anne Radcliffe. Radcliffe was the best-selling author in Britain at the end of the 18th century. Her books were enormously popular, and they were nearly all of this type. They all followed this basic plot pattern. Yeah, now, not to give this too hard a time, I remember uh, the movie reviewer, Roger Ebert saying, really, there's only 36 stories that we all watch. And they're just, every movie is just a retelling of one of those stories. Now, the sad part is that the female Gothic has shrunk that down to this very narrow range, right? Of the, this woman, some woman, uh, her, her sexuality in herself, it's all about her, you know, being uh, captured by a man. It's taken by a man, right? And of course, there's all these undertones of of romance and value to it, you know, involved. You know, it's it's almost like horror romance. Right. Beautiful young woman taken from idyllic secluded life threatened by stepfather or uncle or older suitor, always some older threatening male figure who either wants to kill her and get her money or marry her and take or force her first force her to marry him and take her virginity. Yeah, that that's it. I mean, it's all about her and her sexuality. <laughs> And of course, the, the bad, the villain is an older man, which usually means he has higher status. He has higher status. So it doesn't really come off as very horrific to me. It seems more like uh, something a woman wishes to happen to her. You know, it's like she's valued and this older father figure is going to, uh, she's, he's going to try and capture her the same way you try and steal a diamond or something. You know, you're so valuable, we we can't help ourselves. <laughs> you know, so and so this kind of this, this is consumed by women. You know, she had this formula that worked constantly. And so Michael Marner, like, by the way, he believes or at least he voices that he believes in, you know, like these gender studies. But then he'll turn around and and talk about how how uh, preteen girls, the stuff they like is derisive, and how he can't stand the stuff that his wife likes. So I mean, there's I don't know if there's a lot of double think going on with guys in academia, or if it's a case of they they voice what they need to voice, but believe the complete opposite. You know, I don't know which one it is, but in any event, this is why people are going after you know, the weird fiction writers, especially Lovecraft. Again, it has nothing to do with his racism. I'm not even denying that he's racist, but I mean, he, that's not the reason for it. He said weird fiction basically is consumed by men and not women. And so, therefore, it is allowed to be attacked. It's fair game. And that's all. That's it. <laughs> I mean, take this, uh, this one here, like Bram Stoker's Dracula. Dracula, it, there's one scene where he's turning, I believe it's Mina, into a vampire. He's holding her arms up and forcing her to... To, to suck blood out of his stomach. You've seen it even in the movie. But it's so obvious that it could be, <laughs> it's so obvious not that it can be, but it is a, what is it, a fill-in for the sexual act. It's basically fellatio. 
and because he's a monster and it's coded through some kind of supernatural happening that they get away with it. That's how the Victorians got away with this uh, act, right? <laughs> it's coded. But it's, it's Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula is following the same formula. Dracula is always attacking, uh, draining the blood of women, of course, right? So, but Mina or, or one of the, his uh, victims does get converted into one of these vampires, which the men have to then destroy. You know? Her virginity has been uh, violated and now she must be killed. <laughs> And that's why, uh, like he said, the gender studies uh, are so much into the Gothic. And how come the gender studies tend to avoid the weird fiction? I should maybe avoid the wrong word. Maybe it's just a case where they're just not interested. But why aren't they interested? Well, the Gothic is full of stuff that's attractive to women, or especially the female of Gothic. And the weird fiction is not. And so you have a disinterest in talking about it. And you also have uh, a de the desire to attack it. You can say, okay, it's not something we're interested in. We'll make this uh, Lovecraft and his crew the bad guys. So that's what's going on there. And this is why it has nothing to do with racism. And this is why, you know, this is why they're attacking Lovecraft. And this is all we need to say about this. Thank you.